We welcome Taoiseach and Deputy Mayor Lou MacDonald. Deputy MacDonald, the floor is yours. Taoiseach, there are more than 11,000 children with disabilities waiting for an assessment of needs to be completed. As you know, they are legally entitled to that assessment within six months. Yet over the last decade, we've seen a frightening lack of progress from government in getting children access to their assessment on time. A parliamentary question response to my colleague David Cullinan shows that less children had an assessment of needs completed in 2023 than almost 10 years ago in 2014. So waiting lists have ballooned and capacity has flatlined. Taoiseach, when you became Minister for Health, there were 4,000 children awaiting completed assessments. By the time you finished, that had risen to 5,000. And now, four years later, on your watch as Taoiseach, that figure has more than doubled. This figure of 11,000 doesn't count the thousands of children who were subjected to illegal, substandard assessments under a shortcut procedure devised during your time as Minister for Health. As you know, a procedure that was subsequently struck down by the High Court. Two years on, and you still don't have a plan to stop the state from breaking the law and to ensure that children get their assessment of need within the six months, as is their legal uh, right. The therapists needed to meet demand haven't been hired, and persisting pay inequality between the HSE and Section 39 organisations means that many children's disability teams simply cannot retain experienced staff. This has serious consequences. A child needs a completed assessment of needs to access an appropriate school place, to get the right mix of health, social care and educational supports, and for many guardians and parents and carers for access to social protection supports. So the excruciating weight and uncertainty causes real distress for children and their parents. Jaden from Dublin is one of these children, Taoiseach. He's five years old. Jaden has an intellectual disability, epilepsy, autism, and he requires a feeding tube. He's due to start primary school next September, but his mother, Kira, was told by his psychologist that Jaden must have a completed assessment before starting. So she sent off the assessment of needs form last uh, January, that's 10 months ago, and still she's heard nothing back. Kira says she's now very worried that Jaden won't be able to start school on time, that he won't get the supports that he needs to progress, to fulfil his potential. This is a really horrible situation for any child or any parent. Ni more egan realtis anish gnivu dorira ayenov kun kyarta dli hula na posti sho a kusanch. Tishak, delayed assessments mean parents not having full information, families going unsupported, and delayed development for children. So I'm asking three things of you, Tishak. Firstly, hire the therapists that are needed. Secondly, resolve the pay inequality between ch different children's disability network teams. And finally, please set a date for meeting the legal rights of these children to ensure that no child waits longer than six months for their assessment of needs to be completed. Thank you, Deputy MacDonald. Taoiseach, please. Thanks very much, Karen Coral. I want to thank Deputy MacDonald for, for raising this um, important issue, an issue that I know uh, is close to all our hearts uh, and indeed all our priorities. Uh, and I note your private member's uh, motion on this uh, this week, uh, which does uh, apply an appropriate degree of focus to this very important issue. We've taken a number of steps uh, in recent weeks alone, Count Corla, uh, to try and make significant progress in the lives of children with a disability. We've launched a new autism innovation strategy, 
we've commenced the restoration of in-school therapy supports for children in special schools, because when you talk of, of Jaden, and whilst I don't know all of Jaden's needs, I think it's so important that we put the therapies back uh, in schools so that the education system and the health system are working much more closely together and we provided the funding for that. We've also quite rightly provided a significant degree of additional funding to procure additional assessments of needs. The issue that you rightly highlighted, I think it was the Labour Party in this House who tabled a private member's motion on this quite a while ago, uh, inspired by Cara Darmody. Where, we said, where, th where they said we should look to use private capacity and support the use of the private sector. We have tried to do that in a slightly different way, albeit, but now procuring capacity in the private sector as well as the public sector to significantly increase, and I'll come to that in a moment, the number of assessments of needs. We've published a new €15 million Euro respite investment plan, and quite rightly, as you called for in your private member's motion, we've also agreed, under the leadership of Minister O'Gorman, to opt into the optional protocol uh, to the UN Convention on the Rights of Persons with a Disability. Now, I'm very clear there's a lot more we need to do in relation to disability services. I do get that. I appreciate that. That is why we now see, for the first time, uh, additional funding bringing the disability services budget for next year to over €3 billion, Euro, with a total allocation of €3.2 billion. Euro. This represents an increase of €1.2 billion Euro on disability services in Ireland in five years. It is a record allocation. It will ensure that more people can access more disability services more quickly, and it does also recognise a number of the pay pressures that you referenced in terms of service providers. In relation specifically to the issue of assessments of needs, i just say a couple of things. Firstly, we, we have placed a real focus on, on this. Uh, in May, we announced a decision to finance an assessment of need waiting list initiative through that procurement uh, of private assessments that I referenced. Now, that's working. And the first half of this year, we've seen a 28% increase in the number of assessments of needs uh, completed when compared to the same period just last year. So the campaign led by Cara Darmody is making a difference and showing the positive impact that we can actually have by spending taxpayers' money rightly on using a uh, private capacity to go alongside the public capacity. 1,092 additional children got assessments of needs uh, commissioned from private providers and assessors during the months of June, July and August. So 1,092 more assessments done as a result of that decision we took in May. And I'm very pleased to say that we've now allocated, because it's working, we've allocated a further €10 million Euro of funding in our budget only a few weeks ago to continue this initiative into next year and actually to grow uh, the scope of it as well. Work is also ongoing to increase the capacity of our, children's, excuse me, of our children's disability network teams through several recruitment campaigns. Currently, these teams, called CDNTs, are providing services and supports for over 46,000 uh, children. Disability services were protected during the HSE uh, recruitment embargo, and while recruitment and retention of staff is a challenge, there's significant work ongoing to fill vacant posts on each of the 93 CDNTs. It's positive that we see the number of people now working uh, in these teams increasing uh, year on year, and the disability workforce increasing year on year as well. New posts have also been funded in the budget for CDNTs, namely 20 senior grade and 20 staff grade therapists and 20 therapy assessments. Uh, the, the second point I just make is this. I do think we need to have a very honest conversation, though, around how we respond to that decision in relation to court uh, and the court judgment, because I very much respect the independence of the court. But from a policy point of view, I don't agree uh, that the laws of our land should dictate such rigidity. Uh, in terms of the length of time and assessment of needs required. And that's not just my view, it's the view of countless parents and countless disability representative organisations across this country. Deputy MacDonald. So the only, the only problem with that perspective, uh, Taoiseach, is that uh, the legal obligation for an assessment of needs within sec six months is set out in law. And uh, as as we speak now, the state continues to break the law. You will concede and accept that. I, I hope you also accept that that's not a tolerable situation and that has to change. And for it to change, you need to name a date, in my opinion. That is also the opinion, as you know, of Cara Darmody, of her father, Mark, and everybody who has campaigned very, very hard on this uh, issue. I mentioned Jaden and Kira to you, Taoiseach. Uh, Kira is like many, many parents. She's not on her own. There's 11,000 waiting and waiting for their assessment of needs. She's frantic with worry now. She completed the forms in January. She's waiting. It's 10 months on, and they are left in a state of limbo. I'm sure you'll accept that that is also unacceptable. So I want to put the question uh, to you again, and I might write to you specifically uh, on Jaden's case, although 
He's not an exception. There are, there are many, many others in that situation. Uh, rather than questioning the commitment for, six, for the six-month uh, rule, Taoiseach, can you make a commitment that the law will be respected and that that six-month rule will be upheld? You know that that is the campaign of, of Cara Darmody in the end. Yes, private provision in the meantime and the finance for it, but she said loudly and clearly to you as you stood in photographs with her, obey the law, get the state to obey the law and respect and enforce the six-month rule. Thank you very much, Deputy Taoiseach. Yeah. Uh, and I, I, I smile, I, I smile supportively there because definitely Cara doesn't need you or I to speak for her because she's been very clear in being able to speak to me directly and I've appreciated those, those engagements, blunt and frank as they've been. She's an incredible, uh, an incredible young woman. Um, but what I would say directly to, 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 to Jaden's mum, Kira, and I'd be very, very happy to, to engage with you further on this, uh, Deputy MacDonald, what I would say directly is we have a pathway now to make significant progress on assessments of needs. And it's not just me saying that. I genuinely believe it on the basis of an initiative we started in May. I saw the difference when we put uh, several million, I think seven million from my memory, uh, through Minister Rabbit and Minister O'Gorman uh, into the Assessments and Need Waiting List Initiative. I saw 1,092 additional children get the service. That's why we've now increased that pot by a further 10 million euro. I agree with you. It is to happen only alongside building capacity for the CDNTs. But I do say this, and I said this directly to Cara Darman, and I said it directly to Mark. Uh, I, we will map out exactly the impact that that will have on the six months, and I'm happy to engage with you on that. We'll do it in the context of the service plan. But I still stand over the view from talking to many parents around the country that many parents want access to the therapies rather than an elongated assessment of need. Of course they want an assessment of need, but Thank they want that to be as short an amount of time as necessary to give them the answers as to the therapies the child requires. And that's the bit that I think we should return to in terms of changing and reforming the law. And I'm very happy to work with you on reforming the law in that area if, if that's something we can share a view on. Deputy Batch, please. And Corla and Taoiseach, I want to raise with you the ongoing brutal bombardment by Israel of Gaza and of Lebanon. And I want to ask you about the Occupied Territories Bill. Over the last few days, I think we've all watched with great distress as Israel's actions have escalated still further to an even more horrific degree in Gaza and in Lebanon. On Sunday morning, UNIFIL reported that 15 peacekeepers were injured in Lebanon following an attack by Israel upon them, apparent targeting of UN bases. These actions by Israel represent a serious breach of international law and of the agreement which has allowed UNIFIL to operate in Lebanon since the 1970s for many decades. So our thoughts are with all those peacekeepers stationed in Lebanon, and in particular with members of our own defence forces and, of course, their families. And, of course, our thoughts are with the civilians of Gaza and of Lebanon, who are being killed and maimed in their thousands by the Israeli regime. 40,000 people, Tishak, have been killed in Gaza in just over a year, 115 every day. And over recent days, it has appeared that the Israeli government is now intent on doing to Lebanon what it has done to Gaza. Horrific reporting from Sally Hayden today about the killing of 22 civilians in a village in northern Lebanon, northern Lebanon, hitherto untargeted, of those who've died, 12 women and two children included. And of course, an especially horrific atrocity over recent days in northern Gaza, where we witnessed people being burned alive at Al-Aqsa Al Hospital following an Israeli attack where we know that at least three have been killed and 40 injured. Medicine Sans Frontieres reports this is the seventh time that Israel has bombed the Al-Aqsa hospital since March, the third time in a month. And most horrifying is the report of the death of a 19-year-old young man, an engineering student, Shaban al-Dalou, burned alive in a hospital bed hooked up to an IV drip. Apparently, Washington has, at last, protested yesterday's atrocity to, to the Israeli Premier Netanyahu last night, but that's simply not enough. As Israel continues its genocidal action in Gaza and now in Lebanon, burning civilians, attacking UN peacekeepers, attempting to evict UNRWA from occupied territories, we now see the US government sending military personnel to help Israel. So, Tishik, it's hard to see how the US can act as any sort of peace broker when it has formalised participation in the conflict despite these atrocities. The question is what we in Ireland can do about this and we must do more Taoiseach. We must take unilateral action to sanction, if necessary, if we, can, if we can't get consensus elsewhere, to sanction Israel more effectively. We hear today you have now got changed advice from the Attorney General on the Occupied Territories Bill. Now we say 
in opposition. There has never been a legal impediment to Ireland's passage of that bill and that the government has been too cautious on this. But it's reported now that the Attorney General agrees with us, that the threshold has been reached and of course that the ICJ advisory opinion has changed the context. I know Minister O'Gorman saying it's a game changer and you saying today, I think Taoiseach, that we are now no longer or not waiting on an EU consensus in order to act. So let's act now. Passing that bill is the next step we must take. take. It would represent a real stand against Israel's genocidal actions. And Taoiseach, you would have our support, I think all of the support in the opposition and in this House Thank and, you, and the Upper House. Can you assure us, in the limited time left to this government, will you pass the Occupied Territories Bill to create a meaningful sanction against an, a regime that is intent on such horrific slaughter of civilians? Thanks, Kirkcourt. I want to thank Deputy Bacic for raising um, the most important uh, situation at the moment in terms of the uh, horrific humanitarian catastrophe, the breach of international law and the war crimes that are being committed. Uh, tomorrow I will uh, attend a meeting of the European Union with the Gulf States and on Thursday I'll attend a meeting of the European Council where I'll engage in detail with EU partners on the issue. And yesterday I took the opportunity to speak by phone with the President of Israel, Isaac Herzog, to register my extraordinarily serious concern about the deteriorating situation in southern Lebanon. And I, the specific purpose of that phone call was in relation to the protection of our troops. I'm conscious of the 379 Irish men and women serving with distinction in southern, Leb southern Lebanon now. I believe I speak for the entire House and the entire country when I know uh, we respect their bravery, we thank them for their service, and their safety is paramount uh, to all of us. And I want to be absolutely crystal clear on the record of this House that the deliberate firing at Unifil posts is outrageous. It's a totally unacceptable breach of international law. It's a cause of deepest concern to the Irish people, and most particularly to the families of the Irish Defence Forces personnel serving in Lebanon. I want to join with you uh, in registering that. There needs to be full accountability uh, for these actions. And I'm deeply concerned about the surge of violence in Lebanon and the launch of an Israeli ground incursion across uh, the, blue, the blue line. We've seen particularly vicious and despicable attacks and targeting of refugee camps and civilian targets uh, over the weekend. This is, is deeply shocking. But while all of this is going on, we cannot allow the world to forget about Gaza. Uh, we cannot forget about the fact that there, what I believe is happening in, in Gaza is still a war on children. Uh, we've seen the World Food Programme say they cannot get food in. We cannot get some of the sickest children out uh, for life-saving and life-altering life uh, operations. I've spoken to the King and Queen of Jordan in relation to this, who have been leading the humanitarian effort in many ways. We can't get the aid in. So this, this could not be a more grave or serious situation. And I've been very clear, I've consistently said that every country must use every lever at its disposal. And for different countries, that means different things. For some countries who are providing weapons, they shouldn't be providing weapons. For other countries like Ireland, where we're not providing weapons, we should be doing everything within our power as a country uh, to register our absolute disgust at what is happening. So when our children look back on this time, they say, well, in Ireland, they did all they could uh, to stand up uh, for international law uh, and for human rights. So, so far, we've recognised the state of Palestine. So far, we've consistently said at an EU level that the EU-Israeli Trade Association Agreement uh, should be reviewed because there are human rights clauses. But you're right, we have not managed to create a consensus about that, far from it. And while I'll continue to do that this week in bilateral engagements with colleagues, what I'm saying now is, in light of the ICJ advisory opinion, I asked the Attorney General to review the situation around the occupied Palestinian territories and see if Ireland could move in relation to this. Uh, we did receive last night uh, updated advice in relation to legal issues surrounding the occupied Palestinian territories bill, with the ICJ advisory opinion being an entirely new context. I have to be clear, I have to be clear there, are, there are significant issues from an EU point of view and from an Irish legal point of view with the bill as currently drafted. There genuinely is. That's been the consistent legal advice. But the ICJ advisory opinion is potentially a game changer in terms of what this country uh, can do. It does create a new context for examination of the issues. So we've Thank agreed you, that formal sure. advices will be presented to government uh, next week. I'm happy to engage with the opposition, with government colleagues after that. And I want to send a very clear message, and I'll send this at the European Council. Ireland will no longer wait for an EU consensus on this issue. Thank you. Well, Everybody. I thank you, Tishak, and I think that's uh, encouraging to hear that we will not be waiting for any EU consensus, that the advice is going to Cabinet next week. And certainly, if there's anything in opposition we can do to speed up, ensure expediting of the passage of the Occupied Territories Bill, I think we will all do that. It has cross-party support, uh, and that's very uh, encouraging. On the EU level, uh, we absolutely support your seeking a review of the EU-Israel trade agreement. Um, I think that's very important. You've said you will 
will be at the European Council meeting. You were in Washington last week. I think you could go further. The Irish government could go further in pushing the US administration. That's a point that's been made to me by Palestinian diplomats. Uh, conscious that Ireland has a particular line of communication to the US administration and that we should be using that, as you said, use every lever at our disposal. But we shouldn't forget that the EU remains Israel's biggest trade partner, that EU money is enriching those who are profiting from the slaughter of civilians. And so, Tishak, we believe you need to push further, both at the US level, uh, with the US government, and indeed with EU leaders at the Council meeting this week, to ensure that there is at least uh, some consensus across some member states, and I'm conscious that we've acted with Spain before in the past, uh, and particularly on recognition of the Palestinian state, that there are other EU member states who share our view and increasing numbers of citizens across the 27 countries you, who share the utter horror that everyone feels on witnessing this horrific slaughter in the Middle East. Please, please. Political leaders across Europe are well behind where the people are in relation to this matter. And the reality is there's more that Europe should be doing. Let me just be clear in relation to the United States. Uh, the United States is under no doubt at all of the position of the people of Ireland and the government of Ireland in relation to Gaza, in relation to Palestine, in relation to the need for a ceasefire uh, and a two-state solution. Absolutely no doubt at all. Uh, I, I share your view very passionately. And at every meeting I've attended since becoming Taoiseach, in public and in private, I've consistently argued that the European <laughs> Union should be doing more in relation to using the EU-Israel Association Agreement and the review of that to bring about the circumstances for a ceasefire. That's my view. It's the view of Pedro Sanchez, the Prime Minister of Spain as well. We've worked with him on this. We'll continue to work with him on this. I hope to meet him. I'll, of course, be with him at the European Council. I hope to have an opportunity and will have an opportunity to discuss this directly with him. And I'll continually make that case throughout the week in relation to the need for Europe to do more. The point I'm, point I'm being very honest with you about is, and I don't think this will come as a surprise to anyone, there isn't a consensus in relation to this at an EU level. And what I'm saying now, in the context of the ICJ advisory opinion, I believe now we can re-examine what more Ireland can do because that ICJ advisory opinion does place an obligation, I believe, not just, not just a request, an obligation on us as a country that supports the ICJ to act. Thank you. We move now to Deputy Boyd Barrett. Taoiseach, the images of people burning alive at Alaska Hospital and in a tent camp beside that hospital are possibly the most horrific, stomach-churning, terrifying images of this horrific year of genocide by Israel against the people of Gaza. Uh, I suspect those images will probably uh, be the lasting image in people's minds of the utter, utter horror that Israel is inflicting on the people of Gaza, burning people alive in hospitals, uh, in ICU beds, in tents, innocent people, like Shaban al Dalu, uh, like a falafel seller, a janitor, burning them alive. Uh, this same regime uh, on Sunday killed 22 people in a school in al Nasurat, 22 and 80 injured in a school, repeatedly bombing a school. Uh, over the weekend, there's evidence that Israel has been using white phosph phosphorus, mm -hmm. chemical weapons, in an area where innocent Lebanese people live and where the UN peacekeepers uh, are present. They have threatened Irish troops. Uh, they have attacked UN bases. There's simply no atrocity Israel isn't willing to commit, and we're seeing this in front of our eyes. Now, the thing is, Taoiseach, that most likely the white phosphorus, the bombs that burn people alive in Gaza, uh, the weapons that are being deployed to murder people in Gaza and now in Lebanon uh, came from the United States. And some of them, and very possibly some of those that were used in these, in these horrific atrocities and to commit this genocide went through Irish airspace. And yet your government has done nothing to stop that. The ditch reports that over the weekend, since the Israeli army pointed their tanks at our troops, two more flights have gone through Irish airspace carrying munitions to Israel to carry out their genocidal atrocities against the people of Gaza. And still you let it happen and do nothing about it. 
There were thousands of people, I was one of them, in Shannon Airport at the weekend, saying, why don't you stop this? And that you are complicit as long as you allow it to happen and that you allow the US military to use Shannon, who are up to their necks in arming and supporting and uh, giving succor to the crimes that Israel is committing. Why, when you were in the United States last week, did you not publicly condemn the United States in front of the world for giving the weapons to Israel to commit these genocidal uh, atrocities? Why don't you now tell them that the US military are not welcome in Shannon Airport while they are arming a genocide to commit you, these please. atrocities? What are you going to do to stop uh, munitions going to commit these atrocities and these massacres and these crimes go through Irish airspace? What are you going to do to stop the Irish Bank facilitating the sale of Israeli war bonds to finance the genocidal massacre that has been committed? You're speaking out of both sides of your Thank mouth you, unless Deputy you do Boyd something Barrett. on those issues, Taoiseach. Taoiseach, please. If, if we could measure empathy and compassion in decibels, I wouldn't win. Uh, and you'd win. But the reality is you don't have a monopoly in terms of your concern for the people of Palestine. You certainly don't have a monopoly in terms of your concern for our peacekeeping troops. Something I'm updated on several times a day. We're in constant contact with our peacekeepers and keeping them safe is the number one priority of this government, the number one priority of the United Nations. And we work on it on a round the clock, on a round the clock basis. Can I just make one point more broadly in relation, not, not in relation to anything Deputy Boy Barrett said specifically, but in relation to the broader issue of being able to differentiate between the people of Israel and the policies pursued by the government uh, of Netanyahu uh, and many people who live in this country, um, people of the Jewish faith as well. I just think at a time of heightened concern, including from government condemnation uh, of the actions of the Israeli government, I just do want to differentiate very clearly and let those people know that I can differentiate very clearly between the people of Israel uh, and between the actions of the Netanyahu and the Netanyahu government. This is a government that's acting, Deputy Boy Barrett. By any fair measure, it's acting. Uh, and I, I find it... I find it so peculiar that it's only when I engage with you that you suggest inaction. When I sit down with the Palestinian president, he thanks me for the actions we're taking on behalf of the Irish people. When I sit down with the Palestinian prime minister, he thanks me for the actions he's taking. When I spoke with the prime minister... Oh, sorry, 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 but I, I, no, I'm, 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 answering the charge that, I'm answering the charge that you put on a constant basis. The charge that you put, shout, shout, shout and roar. While you're shouting and roaring, oh, no, no, while you're shouting and roaring, we're acting. We're acting. And the President of Palestine knows it. Yeah. The Ambassador, now they all, now the cacophony. Will you let the Taoiseach respond? Gurmila Mahagov, thank you. He won't respond. He's answering everything but the question. No, no, I'll answer the question exactly, but Listen, I'll answer them as I see fit. There was nobody over here shouting while you were speaking. So please, little courtesy. I'm not going to count Corla except the charge that this government is not taking action in relation to calling out breaches of international law, standing up for human rights, supporting the people of Palestine, recognising the state of Palestine, and supporting our peacekeepers. And quite frankly, I find it stomach churning to hear you suggest that we don't do that, because that's absolutely what we do, and we're taking more actions. And I made very clear in the constructive, the constructive contribution from Deputy Batchik, the steps that we now intend to take in working with the opposition to see if we can do more in relation to trade and the occupied territories. In relation to the issue regarding uh, munitions, oh, also, by the way, you also seem to have this view as to what I did and didn't say uh, in the United States. I mean, I didn't look left and right, but I didn't see you beside me. I didn't see you beside me. I spoke to the President of the United States for about 58 minutes. I know exactly what I spoke to the President of the United States about. The President of the United States knows exactly what Ireland views in relation to this. All levers at all disposal should be used, and all countries should not provide weapons to Israel. Okay? Deputy, please. To Israel. You, you voted did this House to try and stop me going to even have a conversation with Did you ask him so to stop sending weapons? They, they, they voted. Did you ask him to Deputy. stop sending weapons? You, did you ask I him to it. stop sending weapons? Answer the question, which you've been dodging Deputy, from the media. Deputy, I'm sorry, I, I, Deputy. I'd love to answer it. Yeah, so, I, I'd love to answer it. Sure. Sorry. Sorry, sorry, sorry. 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 You have no role in asking any questions. The leader of your group is asking the question. And do your leader, as well as everybody else, the courtesy of listening to the reply. The answer is very clear. The people over there voted in this House last week to suggest I shouldn't go to the United States of America. They now want to critique 
what I said in the United States of America. If it was up to you, I wouldn't have been able to have a conversation. I made the point to President Biden that I make in public and private, all countries should yield all levers to bring about a ceasefire, and that includes the issue of weapons. I made that very clear. In relation to munitions, we're very clear as to what can and can't happen over Irish airspace, and it's expressly prohibited for civilian aircraft to carry munitions of war in Irish sovereign territory without being granted an exemption to do so by the Minister for Transport, uh, and no such exemptions have been granted. Thank you. Deputy Boyd Barrett. Last November, we brought a motion in here calling on you to, to instigate action for genocide against Israel. You voted against it. In October of last year, we brought a motion in here asking you to put in sanctions on Israel as they commenced that genocide. You voted against it. Before any of this started, we asked you to publicly support the demands of Amnesty International in calling for targeted sanctions against Israel for illegal occupation and apartheid. You refused to do it. You've been dragged kicking and scheming all the way. You've blocked the Occupied Territories Bill since 2018. And now, because there are tens of thousands of people on the streets and we are seeing genocide unfold in front of our eyes, you're thinking about looking again at the Occupied Territories Bill. But you continue to allow the US military to go through Shannon when that government is arming the Israeli state to commit genocide. Under the Genocide Convention, as I pointed out to you and your government last November, we are obliged as signatories to do everything in our power to deter the, even the possibility of a genocide. You haven't done anything to try and deter the possibility. That was why the Genocide Convention Thank was developed you, after the Holocaust. Uh, and we have done nothing to discharge our obligations to actually deter the prevention of a, a, a genocide when weapons going through Irish Thank airspace you, to Deputy, commit that genocide are going through our airspace and a military machine is using our airport that is up to its neck in Israel's genocidal crimes. When are you going to do something Thank about you. any of these things? And when are you going to stop distorting the record of this government? Uh, and I know, I, know, I, know, I know what you do. You'll put up the little clip and you'll cut it and you'll show how you shouted at the Taoiseach and said we're doing nothing for the people of Palestine. What oh, I say, you never, what I say, what never I say, put up clips, do you know? The people, what I say to the people watching those clips, what I say to the Jesus. people watching those clips is know this, know this. Mm. This country is leading at a European level in terms of standing up for Palestine, standing up for international law, standing up for human rights. This is a country that is now going to take further action in relation to it. And you know what, I think there's a little bit of you that's nearly frustrated and upset that we've offered to constructively work with the opposition in relation to how we move this forward. Because we, it's not for you, you're not the international court. The international law-based system doesn't work with you standing up saying this is the way it is. What we do is we follow the advisory opinions of the ICJ. And when the ICJ gave an advisory opinion in July, the three leaders of this coalition said, well, what does that mean? Mean in relation to the context of what this parliament, this law can do. We sought updated legal advice and now we're proceeding on that basis. This issue, you, you seek to divide on every single issue. We are as no, outraged, we seek action. We are as outraged action. in relation to human rights breaches and international law, so. but we also condemn all people who breach international law and you still refuse to condemn Iran and you don't believe that Israel has a right to live in peace and security. Us. Thank you. Should we go to Deputy Michael Lowry, please? I Early 2025, we will have a new government, a new European Commission and Parliament. Over the coming months, big policy decisions will be made that will shape our future to 2030 and beyond. As a country, we're running to catch up on infrastructure required for a growing population. When it comes to airports, which are critical to our success as an island nation, the passenger cap at Dublin Airport has highlighted the abject failure of aviation policy, leading to an embarrassing public row. This staff situation continues while opportunities and solutions at Shannon and Cork are ignored. Shannon has the infrastructure and capacity to, to handle 3 million more passengers. Likewise, Cork has the capacity for an additional 2 million passengers. Ireland does not have an airport capacity problem. What it actually has is a policy problem that should be turned into a national opportunity. By addressing the policy issues, Ireland can tr transform its national airport network into a cohesive system that supports balanced regional development and enhances national connectivity. Dublin Airport has severe constraints, which at times is choked with passengers and clogged with slow access, car parking and accommodation issues. Ireland is struggling to meet binding decarbonisation targets. There are 7 million journeys to and from the west of Ireland to Dublin Airport. Almost 4 million of those are inbound tourists destined for the west of Ireland. These tourists would prefer and should be landing at Shannon rather than having to travel to and from Dublin. 
Shannon Airport's catchment area contains 38% of the population, but accounts for only 4% of Ireland's airport traffic. We are relying on Dublin and the already strained infrastructure of Dublin City to accommodate 86% of air traffic. This is happening despite the fact that 40% of the passengers, their primary purpose is to visit locations beyond Dublin. This scenario is inefficient and imprudent. Failing to fully utilise and maximise the current potential of Shannon and Cork, which can immediately handle an additional 5 million passengers, is not only short-sighted, but in the current atmosphere and climate, it is irresponsible. We can no longer afford, as an island, to risk having one airport become, becoming a single point of failure. Shannon Airport is the underutilised resource that can immediately assist with constrained problems. We must deliver a national aviation policy that brings passengers to where they want, wish to go. That relieves congestion in Dublin and delivers connectivity to the Shannon reading, including North Tipperary. It would stimulate tourism further. You would have investment and economic growth in the region. We have three major state-owned airports, Dublin, Shannon and Cork. Talk of capacity constraints is an artificially created bind, created by the tunnel vision of our aviation policy makers. We must take the opportunity to review strategy and set out a strong, sustainable policy for the development of Irish aviation across the region. Thank you, Deputy Lowry. Thanks very much, uh, Keon Cordon. Thanks to Deputy Lowry uh, for, for, for this important question in relation to aviation policy and, and indeed the role of Shannon. So look, more, more broadly on the, on the passenger cap at, at Dublin Airport, as you know, this arises from a 2007 condition attached to planning permission for Terminal 2. I, I don't believe a 17-year-old uh, decision holding back growth in 2024 uh, to be a sustainable uh, situation. And indeed, I, I engage with Minister Ryan on this to see if there are any options open to government, even in the short term, to try and mitigate the negative impacts uh, or indeed accelerate the resolution of the underlying problem. Because I want to come to the issue specifically of the regions, but I'm sitting beside the Minister for Tourism, who quite rightly uh, reminds me of the fact that so many of the visitors who land in Dublin Airport do travel off to the region. I think around 38% of people are landing in Dublin or heading west. Uh, of the 250,000 people working in the tourism sector, around 70% of them are in the regions outside of Dublin. So I very much get the point uh, in terms of the importance of balanced regional development. And of course, a plane landing in Dublin benefits in many ways the entire country as people spread out uh, across, across our island as well. It is a long-standing policy to develop Dublin Airport as a secondary hub airport with the necessary capacity to connect key existing and emergent global markets. But it is important uh, to the government that we ensure sustainable development of Dublin Airport and the balance uh, of our objectives in the national aviation policy, uh, the needs of business and tourism interests, and the legitimate rights of, of local residents as well. So we've seen about 124.6 million allocated to regional airports over the course of this government's term alone. Around 47 million has been allocated to Shannon Airport uh, since this government uh, came to office. And Shannon Airport is currently eligible for funding under the new Regional State Airport Sustainability Programme. Now, there are no capacity constraints at Shannon Airport or indeed at any uh, of our regional airports. In 2023, Shannon passenger numbers were 1.96 million. That was an increase of 22% uh, on 2022. And indeed, it was the highest level of passengers uh, in Shannon Airport last year since 2009 which I think is an encouraging sign. Ryanair recently announced increased services for the 2024 winter schedule at uh, Shannon Airport with, I think, a 5% increase over the capacity they offered last winter. That's about 30,000 uh, additional seats. So I want to assure Deputy Lowry that our national aviation policy does, of course, recognise the strategic importance of Dublin Airport, but it also very much seeks to optimise the operation of the Irish Airport network to ensure maximum connectivity uh, with the rest of the world. Shannon, Shannon Airport excuse me, has the capacity to grow uh, to 5 million passengers, even within its current uh, infrastructural uh, footprint as well. The additional passenger capacity can be utilised to maintain and enhance connectivity to the west, the northwest and the midlands, to facilitate charter flights, sporting events and additional scheduled services which cannot be met uh, at Dublin Airport. There is a real opportunity, I think, for Shannon Airport to achieve its potential to expand services and meet currently unmet demand. And of course, it does also have the option of the US uh, pre-clearance facility, which is a huge resource as well. So we're very confident uh, of Shannon Airport's future and very eager to continue to support the growth of Shannon Airport. Thank you, Airport. Deputy Lowry. 
Taoiseach, you, you say that Shannon has improved, which it has in terms of passenger numbers, and that it has the additional capacity, but it needs support, it needs help, it needs political direction, it needs ministerial direction and the support of the airlines to increase, to take up the level of capacity it has. Now, this issue is also about supporting business that needs direct connectivity from its base in the Midwest to Europe and to further afield. It's about stopping the waste of time and carbon energy on long road journeys. People who are starting a journey by air doing three and four hours uh, on our roadways. It's about having an aviation policy that supports Dublin as a base for global connectivity and ensures that passengers who want to fly to the regions can get there directly. Shannon already, as you say, has the infrastructure, it has the facilities, and it can solve in resolving the constraint problems that we're currently experiencing at Dublin. It has first-class infrastructure that is underused in a, no a location that people want to go to. Shannon has the longest runway in Ireland and also one of the longest in Europe. It has everything going for it, uh, Taoiseach, but the problem is we're not getting political direction to ensure that whatever incentives are required, we need to take the pressure off Dublin and redirect them to Shannon and to Cork and utilise the facilities that are there that are part of our national infrastructure. That's the problem. Thank you, Deputy. Well, thanks very much uh, to, to, to Deputy Lowry, and, and just I suppose for me to reiterate my position, and I'm not saying it's, it's the Deputy's position at all, but I, do, I don't see it as a, as a choice between the passenger cap at Dublin Airport being resolved and the growth of our regional airports. Quite frankly, we need to do both. Uh, this is an island. Air connectivity is really important. And to, in fairness to my colleague, uh, Minister James Lawless, who has responsibility uh, for this area, he's been to Shannon Airport three times uh, already over the summer months and I hope that is seen uh, in the region as a sign of his commitment and a sign of the government's commitment uh, to Shannon Airport as well because the deputy is right, Kevin Corla. Uh, this is an airport that has the infrastructure, uh, it has very significant infrastructure, it already has capacity to grow further within the confines of that infrastructure, it has very good leadership. I had the pleasure of meeting the chief executive when I was down there to see President Zelensky a couple of months ago. It has the US pre-clearance uh, facility uh, and indeed we now see the passenger numbers growing with the highest passenger numbers at that airport since 2009. And we see airlines like Ryanair making a decision to significantly expand by around 30,000 extra seats, uh, the, number of, uh, the number of seats going to, to Shannon Airport uh, this year. So we will work with the Deputy, and I'll ask Minister Lawless to keep in touch with you on this Thank matter. Thank you very much. Taoiseach, that concludes leaders' questions for today and enables us to proceed to uh, take... Uh